Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we are going to focus on tape 11 and 12, a new tape for a new era. We're going to be talking about some updated updates and some best practices, and we have facilitating our call today the National Director for the Data Recognition Corporation, Mike Johnson. We are very appreciated that we're really appreciated, appreciative that Mike is able to join us today and share this information with us. So I thank him up front. But before I turn it over to Mike, I want to remind you that you have the ability to submit questions. And I know a lot of you do have questions. So please ask your questions via that Q&A tab. And um, Mike will be monitoring that throughout the uh, presentation. Also, remember that your microphones are muted, so you do have to ask those questions through that Q&A tab. This webinar, like all of our IPDA webinars, are recorded and they are archived on the IPDA website. You should already have the PowerPoint, which was already um, distributed and loaded on the IPDA website. So that is there for you to follow as well. So I really look forward to this information, Mike, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. On behalf of all of us, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Okay, thank you very much, and, and welcome everybody for the webinar. I'll go ahead and get started, and, and as June mentioned, plenty of uh, opportunities to ask questions, and I'll answer as many as I can in the time that we have, and we can uh, review those questions after the webinar is done today as well. Just a real overview, quick overview of where we're at with TABE 11 and 12, obviously aligning to the new standards and having one length of test. I think everybody's familiar with that now. There's not a short form or a, or a long form. There's just one length of TABE and we'll talk about the length of the test a little bit more as we go forward. Uh, and also having the content areas of reading, math, and language, not having those spelling, language mechanics, or vocabulary separate tests that TABE 11 and 12 had but having uh, them more combined into the main headings of reading, math, and language. We'll talk a little bit more at the end about some correlation studies that we're doing, doing to high school equivalency and to uh, college placement uh, alignments. So I'll have some more information as we continue on the web webinar. Where we're at today with the different versions of TABE, TABE 9 and 10 uh, is still available, but not for federal reporting. So that the federal, uh, approval ended on June 30th and TAME 11 and 12 is now federally approved until June 30th of 2024. We're very happy that we're the only assessment to have full NRS approval out to 2024 for all content areas uh, in reading math and language. I'm not going to really cover TAME Class E too much today, our ESL assessment, but just to let you know that we are in the process of moving that over to our computer-based platform uh, as well as continuing with the paper and pencil version. So later this fall, we'll have TABE Class C on the same Insight platform that TABE Online is on. Uh, and then in the spring, we will be doing some uh, recruitment for some field testing for the new version of Class C that we'll be working on early next year. So you'll have more information about that as we go forward. One of the partnerships that we announced at CoWave was a partnership with uh, Literacy Pro's LASIS data system. And I know Florida doesn't use the LASIS data system, but the reason I included this on the slide is that this new partnership has allowed us to also start to share data with other data systems, uh, usually through an FTP file transfer on a nightly basis. So I know um, there are programs that use Focus or um, other databases and we have the ability you can certainly contact us uh, and my information will be at the end and we can discuss how we can set those data transfers up there's a couple of, of districts in Florida that already do get data feeds on a nightly basis and to feed into those data systems so um, that is moving forward uh, our goal is to be able to share data with the state so that you can eliminate any hand entering of data in for tape scores and um, but Florida, like many states, it has a proprietary system, so we'll be working on that on a case-by-case -case basis. One of the big things that I want to talk about today is, is the resources that are available for TABE 11 and 12. And those resources are all found on our public website, which is tabetest.com. And I will go over to that website real quick. 
um, and point out a few things on the tabetest.com website. The first piece that I want to talk about is the menu bar at the top. We will just look at the resource tab today. And if we go under the resource tab under tab 11 and 12, there are a lot of links that are available to different resources and white papers. The very first one on the right hand side is a comparison of all federally approved assessments for adult ed. So if you wanted to know the difference between TABE and other assessments, that chart is available there. We also have a webinar series that happens usually the third Thursday of every month on this webinar series. And I'll click on that real quick. It will open up and we do record our webinars. These are um, related to TABE topics. So again, some were on scanning, some were on TABE online. We had one that was aligning to the curriculum and instruction. We had slides provided from our publishing partners and uh, had Jeff Gumas from Crowded Learning talk about free resources that are aligned to the new standards as well. So these webinars, as I mentioned, are recorded. If you don't attend live, you can always watch these recordings. And if you're not getting emails about the webinars, there's a link at the very bottom to add your email address to the notifications for the, the monthly webinars. A couple of other resources on the resource tab that I want to point out. The one is the blueprints, and I'll go there real quick. The blueprints are all the detailed information related to each level of TABE in the content area. So there are several blueprints for reading math and language. I will open up the math blueprint for level A. This blueprint is showing you what college and career readiness standards or domains are being covered on that specific of level of TABE. So again, this is level A for math. It is encompassing five domains, statistics, numbers, algebra, geometry, and functions. They are color, co color coded. And if you scroll down a little bit, the first color is geometry. And it will tell you what subdomains are covered, again, within level A of TABE for geometry. And on the far right hand side, it will list the emphasis level of that domain. Lower emphasis means fewer questions on that level of TABE. Higher emphasis means more questions related to that subdomain on TABE 11 and 12. So if we look real quick at the first description, it says no precise definition of angle, circle, perpendicular line, and we see that's a low emphasis. It's a low emphasis because that's a, a, a more of an intermediate skill for TABE M and D to address versus the third one down that says use volume formulas for cylinders, pyramids, cones, and spheres to solve problems. That's a high emphasis. That's a targeted skill for level A of TABE. And so that's why there's more questions related to that than there is the first one. If we open up the level D blueprint, we would likely see these same two subdomains, but with different emphasis levels. So uh, it is important if you're a math teacher or a reading teacher or a language teacher to look at all the bl blueprints for those domains or for those content areas and see where the domains are introduced, where they're covered at the highest levels, and maybe where they have lower emphasis uh, as you go up in the tape levels. So those are the, the blueprints for TABE 11 and 12. A couple of other resources that we'll touch on and we'll, we can come back um, is there is also a uh, number of resources that are available for training beyond uh, or more individualized training. So for TABE Online users, if you have somebody that's new and they want to learn what to do with TABE Online, there is a on-demand training videos for TABE Online and they're done in short videos, about 15, 20 minutes on related topics. So in the purple area on the left, if you wanted to learn how to manage users, you could click on that link. If you wanted to know how to work with student management systems and registering students, there's a link for a short video there as well. And then finally, uh, I'll show a couple of other resources as we go forward. Um, one of them is our scale score to grade equivalent range chart. And we'll talk a little bit about this as we go forward and look at an actual report. But a number of programs do want to always have an idea of the grade range. Table 11 and 12 does not have grade equivalents on the printed reports or on the PDF reports. We, they're not there because of the uh, 
Um, the way the new standards are o overlapping one another and grade equivalents are very subjective based on what people's familiarity are with that, that certain grade level. And I'll use uh, level uh, math. I'll go down to the math section and talk about ninth grade math. Many people feel that ninth grade math is, is algebra, first year of algebra. If you look at the new college and career readiness standards, and if you look at the TABE blueprints, there's algebra on every level of TABE. So what, what is ninth grade math specifically as defined by college and career readiness standards is a lot different than what it might be when, when you took ninth grade math or when uh, somebody else maybe that took ninth grade math and they took geometry instead of algebra because they took algebra in eighth grade. So it's always a subjective score and that's a little bit more the case with the college and career readiness standards. But what we did do with these charts is compare the six levels of the NRS on the left-hand side and where they define the grade ranges for the NRS and broke those out into the 12 grade ranges and then listed the scale score range. So again, a ninth grade for table 11 and 12 math would be between a scale score of 596 and 626. That is only achievable on certain levels of TABE, and we'll look at that as we go forward. But just as a reminder, that's ninth grade as defined by the new college and career readiness standards from the Department of Ed, not as it related to table nine and 10 or uh, any other kind of recollections that you might have for that. I'll come back to the, the website here shortly and go through a couple of other resources as we continue. As I mentioned, the webinar series, um, if there's a, a big topic that you think would be beneficial, we're certainly open to suggestions on what topics we cover on a monthly basis. So you can always email me any topics that you have for that. Looking at the, the test content specifically, and, and I think I've shown this uh, a few times to different audiences, so I won't spend a lot of time, but if we look at reading for levels E, M, D, and NA, most noticeably the change is less of a focus on literary text, more focus on reading for information. So we see the new passages that TABE uses, there's much more an emphasis on reading for information, and that's because what the standards are driving for. Same thing with math, much more of a focus on um, applied skills. Not that computation is not measured or used, but a lot of times the computation skills are within a question that is using some applied skills as well. So you know, you know, TABE 9 and 10 had a separate computation test and a separate applied test under the new standards because of the emphasis on the applied skills, it's all within one math test. And then with the language test, the kind of the key point under language is to remember that the new standards have some incorporation of those areas that were outside of TABE 9 and 10 in the past, spelling, language mechanics, some of the vocabulary areas now get rolled into the general heading of language and under the new standards. So it's important if you are a language teacher to look at the blueprints to understand what's being covered and what emphasis level for those different skills. I want to point out um, some of the big changes in, in the national reporting system, what the U.S. Department of Ed uses to track gains for adult ed programs. The blue box at the top is the old level one math descriptor that TABE 9 and 10 was aligned to. The orange box is what TABE 11 and 12 has to be aligned to going forward to get the federal approval to use for, national, for accountability tracking. As you can see, much more intensive one sentence compared to five paragraphs. And the five paragraphs are very specific in the information that it's uh, requiring. So uh, I'll read paragraph three, which says algebraic thinking, students prepared to exit this level understand and apply the properties of operation to addition and subtraction problems. Where that old descriptor just said that the individual had little or no recognition of numbers or simple counting skills or minimal skills such as the ability to add or subtract single digit numbers, it didn't mention understanding and applying uh, or some of the other areas that I've highlighted in red, explain your reasoning, analyze and compare, organize, represent and interpret. And again, this is the level one math descriptor. So it's much more rigorous from the expectations at, at every level. And this is the change that the Department of Ed has made related to the standards and the expectations of students. And I know there's a, a question that's been posted already about um, 
the GED and pre and post testing um, that students might be prepared for the GED at lower levels of TAVE. And, and that is certainly what we're hearing from some areas, but I think it's the important part is to remember what the goal of these descriptors were from the US Department of Education and what what's different between uh, high school equivalency and adult assessments or adult basic ed assessments. And when the US Department of Ed released the new standards and these descriptors, they made a decision to increase the rigor and the expectations of the, the competencies that they were covering so that adult ed students were better prepared leaving an adult ed program than, they, than simply being able to pass a high school equivalency test. And I understand that many programs, that's the goal is to get the student to pass. But what the Department of Education has said numerous times is that the goal is that you are better prepared upon exit and simply passing a high school equivalency test does not necessarily align to succeeding in those next steps of post-secondary or workforce programs. And I think it's important to remember passing a high school equivalency test means that you barely passed high school. So get, getting C's and D's in high school, you still got a diploma, but were you, were you prepared for college or were you prepared for the workforce by doing you know, that level of work in high school? And what the Department of Education wanted is that those higher levels of the NRS, the level five, level six, is preparing students to succeed at post-secondary programs. So that means going into a post-secondary program and not having to take a non-credit class for developmental skills or you know, being able to be eligible for better jobs or higher level jobs than simply just an entry level job. So it's important to remember that was the focus from the Department of Ed with the new standards and having those goals from the Department of Ed is where then TABE has to have the items written to get the federal approval um, aligning to these new expectations. So a student may be able to leave a program or be prepared to pass a high school equivalency test, but if they finish the adult ed program, they're more likely to succeed at that next step. And that was the goal for the Department of Ed's uh, standards. Another part of that is, is aligning to high school equivalency versus aligning to the federal requirements. These descriptors, the one that I have on the screen, are what TABE has to align to. Yes, TABE and the GED and the HiSET and the TASC, all the high school equivalency tests are aligned to the college and career readiness standards. But as a subset of that, TABE has to then align to each of these descriptors for each of the levels and, and demonstrate that in our application for federal approval. There is no federal oversight for high school equivalency tests. So uh, high school equivalency publishers, and we are one of them, you know, we align to the College of Career Readiness Standards, but there is no standard of what alignment means. And there's no oversight or review of what, what alignment means. So that's why some people will say TABE covers geometry more than the GED. Well, that's because the descriptors are asking for that at a higher level. And so that's why in order to get the federal approval, we have to also align to these descriptors. Let me move on to our next slide. And I wanted to talk a little bit about our testing times. Most of you are aware that we reduced our testing times about a month or so ago, uh, maybe three weeks ago, and, and they're now in effect. Um, for TABE Online, and I believe the paper instructions are getting posted this week, I believe. Um, and our new times are based on the uh, analysis of data. We had a little over 2 million tests uh, taken during our collection period and looking at the average times and our uh, require approved maximum allowable times. And when we look at our allowable times, one of the key metrics that the Department of Ed uses is for us is that a 90th percentile of students finishing the test in the allotted time. So we lowered our reading test from 120 minutes to 100 minutes. Within that 100 minutes, 90% of the students are finishing within that time frame, And that's kind of the, the, the threshold that the Department of Ed uses. Now our average time for reading is about 75 minutes. And so then we see language at 55 minutes, that's a reduction from 60, but the average is 40 minutes. And then math is a combined, uh, was 75 minutes, now down to 65 minutes. 
and the average is around 45 minutes for, for math. We also reduced the locator times quite a bit. The locator um, was longer and it does have more questions, but what we're finding from our research team is that students were spending too much time on the locator and may, after a lot of you know concentration on one or two single questions, be able to then get that question right, but not really understand the concept or could benefit from some instruction based on that concept. And so by reducing the locator time, the goal is to move the students through the locator quicker. You either demonstrate that you understand that competency or that if you don't, then you can leave that question blank or you'll get it wrong. And that will be an area of focus uh, as they go through the pretest area. So uh, by shortening the time, yes, we're shortening the, shortening the test, but also allowing the students to move through the demonstrate their proficiency at each of the levels for, for the locator. This chart is also available um, on tabetest.com. It's right on the main page. Uh, you may have seen that when we went out there to the, to the website, but it's also on a chart within the resource tab. So it's posted in two different places. Just real quick on our Insight test engine, uh, for those programs that are using Tab Online or using our scanning platform, that all runs through our, our internal platform called uh, Insight. So we use that for computer-based testing and for scanning. It can run on any platform, Windows or Mac or Linux or Chrome. A lot of correctional programs are starting to use Chromebooks more and more. And as I mentioned, Tape Class E will be moving to the Insight platform later this fall um, and then have some updates in the springtime as well. If we look at the Insight portal, the, the portal is really two different parts. One is where you as a user goes, and that's just a website. And the other side is where the students go to take a test, and that's our secure browser that uh, locks down the computer when the students are taking the test. So if you are using Tab Online or using the scanning system, you can get to your data at any point by going to the, the eDirect website. And you can do that from your phone, you can do that from home or work, and have all access to all your, your data couple of things that have changed in the Insight platform is you probably have noticed that the menus uh, options have now gone from being horizontal across the top to being vertical. So they are now a drop down menu and the still same resources or same options for the menu, but just more in a vertical display fashion for that. Another update is that we are trying to post any pertinent updates right to the main page of the home screen for Insight. They used to be under my information and under messaging, but now we wanted to post them. So you can see just in the background that we've had a couple announcements in June and August and September, different things that were happening with Insight um, and so that you have information there. If we do have a, an outage or anything that's happening, we would post that as quick as possible there. I also wanna make a point of the Support number is also posted on the main page there, 866-282-2250. If you are having any trouble, you can always call the support team for any help with Tab Online or the scanning system. One of the things that I wanna point out as kind of a best practice for Tab Online is, is just a, a remembering that the um, main page, and this is we're in test management on this screen, and is very similar to a couple of other screens, the top section of the screen is actually a search field. So you're kind of narrowing down, do I have a test session already created that's applicable to what I'm doing? And it allows you to search whether I wanna find a student, so I could type in Mike Johnson there and find all test sessions that Mike Johnson is in. Or I could look for a specific date range for any session. So before you create new sessions, you could check to see if a colleague has created a similar session um, and then be able to use that session as well. We are in the process of doing some updates to the test sessions. I know that would be a big point with many people that um, right now you cannot archive your test sessions and we are working on a, a utility to archive the test sessions. We are probably gonna do that with table nine and 10 sessions automatically and then um, allow you control for table 11 and 12 sessions. So that is under development now. I don't have a release date for that. So once I have some more information, I will keep you updated on that. 
um, but you can also um, be able to archive that in the future to keep a cleaner uh, testing window when you look at your, your test sessions. A couple of other things that are important within TABE Online, and this is again um, dealing with test sessions, and I, I have uh, North Dakota's example up on the screen, uh, not specific because they're bad, just because it was the one that I was able to access quickly. And I'm going to focus in on the fourth column from the left. It's called session name. It's important to give your test sessions a, a good name. And a good name is very descriptive and allows you to um, communicate to other colleagues what that session is about. So we can see the very first one. It says Table 11 Math Level D. That's pretty specific. But if we look at the third one down, it just says Table 11. So if, if I created that session, maybe I know what it means, but if I'm not there on a certain day or somebody else is logging in and looking at the sessions that are available, they don't really know what Table 11 means, where the first one, it's Table 11 Math Level D, that's very specific. So it's important as you're creating test sessions to always think about what that scenario based about. And it could be September, it could be October, um, it could be first semester, but you know, could be called TABE pretest 11 um, and have the auto locator turned on. So I would just encourage you as you're creating sessions to be as specific in the session name so that uh, other colleagues will be able to understand that and maybe not have as many test sessions created that have similar scenarios. One update that you've probably also seen um, I think most programs in Florida have this turned on, but we, we're in the process of reviewing that. But this is a, a, a utility that will recommend the next test level. Um, and on the screen, what we have here is that we're searching for students to put into a specific test. And the shaded area at the top says it's Table 11, Reading, Math, and Language. And I'm specifically going to create a test session that says Level uh, D for Reading. If you notice the yellow box and it has that uh, information about the, the, I believe that's called a tilde there or a squiggly line. But if you see a student with that mark in front of their name, which one on the left hand side of the bottom of the screen does, that student has already taken level D of the reading math or language test. So it's, it's telling you that it's not appropriate to put that student into the session because it would be repeating that. Now it's not preventing you from doing it, but it's going to uh, just notify you that, you know, that it's probably not a best practice to put that student in there uh, in a general sense. So this is a new feature and, and it can be turned on for programs that do federal reporting where, you know, you want to be notified, you know, if I'm going backwards or repeating a test. So this is a new uh, utility that was built into the system. If you do the item export, I'm sorry, the, the, the data extract from the reports menu, you'll notice on the far right hand side, it also has that listed um, that what, oops, let me go back to that. I was trying to, it'll tell you what the level test is appropriate for that student. So the very first one we see that student took, um, they're being scheduled into a level A, or they last, they last took level A language. So their next test would be um, 12A, from 11A to 12A where the second student, they took 11D math and they their next recommended levels would be 12D or 11A or, or 12A. So giving you those options, again, not requiring you to do anything, just notifying you of what a recommended level for the next student would be or the next testing scenario would be. I wanted to touch on the scanning system for TABE 11 and 12. It is different than it was for 9 and 10. TABE 9 and 10 required an expensive Scantron scanner and expensive software. Uh, for TABE 11 and 12, we've changed that to do away with the software, also made it uh, work with image-based scanners that are much more affordable. There's an example of some scanners here. There's, there's a webinar, as I mentioned, recorded about scanning. The very first scanner, the ES200, is $199 on Office Supply Store websites. So that's a lot different than the four or $5,000 that a Scantron scanner was in the past. There are hundreds of scanners that will work. Um, I would encourage you that if you are hand scoring Table 11 and 12, you know that it's very labor intensive because there, there's two point questions to work on. There's multiple select questions. 
to be able to understand. There's also unscored questions to, to keep track of. So by scanning, you're going to save a lot of time and energy on, on over hand scoring. I, I realize in the past, hand scoring was an expensive proposition, but hopefully with the much more affordable scanners and no software required, and there's no additional fee to scan TAB 11 and 12, that programs that are doing hand scoring would look at the scanning system and, and switch to that because it is easier to do. Also, if you do scan your answer sheets, all that data gets into the same database that we use for TAB online. So as we talked about earlier, extracting that data out into databases, whether it's local databases or state databases, it's, it can be done through the scanning or the TAB online system. You may have a scanner already that might work. You just have to make sure that it is a dual read, continuous feed, Twain compliance scanner. The dual read means it reads both sides of the page at once. Continuous feed means that it's not a flatbed scanner that you might have at home. It looks more like a fax machine or a copy machine, um, that it is a continuous feed, that it has a tray that you put the answer sheets into. And then Twain compliant just simply means that it connects to the internet. Um, the difference between most large office copy machines, those are not Twain compliant because when you scan something on a large office copy machine, you have to do something with that file. You either send it to yourself as a PDF, you save it to a network drive, but it's not going somewhere automatically. And that's what the Twain um, technology allows. And it's very similar to your online banking. If you're using online banking on your phone and you take a picture of a check to deposit it into your account, you don't attach it to your account. Once you take that picture, the check goes right into your account. So it's kind of the same um, protocols behind the scene that it's automatically going into the account without having to do that second step. So as long as you have it, and, and if you do have a scanner that isn't on our list and you wanna see if it's compatible, just type the scanner name into Google and look at the items or the specifications for that scanner. If you see the word Twain, then it, there's a very good chance that that scanner will work with TABE online, uh, with this TABE scanning system. I wanna switch and talk about the reports. And again, the reports are both for online and for scanning. As we go through the reports, um, all of them are accessible through the Insight platform. There is the individual profile, which is the normal uh, everyday report that programs are using to get the detailed information on a student and, and when they've tested. There's also a portfolio report available that allows you to look at um, all the tests a student took over time. So if a student has tested two or three times in a year, you're allowed to set the date range for the portfolio and it will capture a summary of all those testing occurrences in one report. If you do the locator test, you can also run the locator report to see the outcomes of the locator. The bulk export is the file that I talked about earlier going into the database system. So we can set up a, a nightly extract to go in uh, to be delivered to you through an FTP system. You also have the ability to do a roster report. So if today you're testing a group of students in a test session and you wanted to see a summary of all those students, you can do the roster report and get a summary of all that very similar to the portfolio report, but of m multiple different students in the roster report. And then you all have the ability to export your data out in your own Excel format. So there's a local extract that allows you to, to do that and pull that information out. We are in the process of doing a few updates to our reports. Um, a couple of them I'll talk about uh, in different phases. Phase one of the report update has been completed. And phase one added the number of points on the bottom of the screen in the red box. So the left-hand side of the screen on the bottom is the pie chart that we saw from the blueprints. So this happens to be math level M. So there would have been um, six sections of the pie chart for math broken out into measurement and data, number and number operation, base 10 fractions. And if we now look across, there are six questions related to measurement and data those six questions totaled 10 points. So there were several two point questions and this student only obtained one of those 10 points. So it didn't do very well in that uh, specific subdomain. And we can see that listed as non-proficiency. So adding those points, now you have an idea of you know, how many points that student obtained in each of the subdomains. 
We also added, and I don't have it in a red box, but on the top right side of the screen, we've added an MSG or a measurable skills gain indicator. And again, um, we see the first two reading and math is listed as no, but the third language test is listed as yes. So this indicator looks at this student and have they taken any of these tests before and what level NRS level were they before and did this current test go up? So using language as the example, their score today was a NRS level two. That means previously they had an NRS level one language score that was captured in the system. And now this one is demonstrating that they've improved. So just again, another indicator to say, has this student shown a, a, a measurable skills gain in that content area? The second phase of the report update is on the second page of the report. And again, the second page is the diagnostic page for uh, all reports, whether online or using the scanning system. The left-hand side of the page is again, the, the blueprint areas. So we see measurement and data again, fractions, base 10. And if we follow that along, today the report ends at the skill column. It is not specific to the student, it's specific to the skills that are covered on level M of this math test. So I could go today back to the previous slide and see that this student was not proficient in measurement and data. And then on the second page, I would look under the skills to say what skills are within measurement and data for me to work on. On September 30th, we're launching an update to add the needs improvement column to this report. So this report now will become an individual diagnostic profile for each student. It'll still have the skills column, but it will be the skills that they've uh, achieved and then the areas of improvement uh, in the second column. So today, all the bullet points are in the skill column. On September 30th, those will be broken out between the ones that you have achieved skills and then areas of, of improvement. So I think it will be a, a much a more useful diagnostic report for, for teachers and programs to understand where a student needs improvement on and, and align that to instructional pieces. A third phase, and I don't have the slide for the third phase, is a new reporting portal that we're working on that will allow you as a user to have more control over uh, aggregating or disaggregating data. So today our reports are these pre-populated PDF reports. And a lot of them just run on the date range or on a student's name and, and will pull data related to that. What a lot of programs have asked for is much more flexibility in uh, setting the date or data parameters. So for example, if I wanted to have a report of everybody in my program that's below an NRS level four in math, that's something that the new portal will allow you to do. Or show me everybody that needs improvement in understanding decimals. Um, so that would be another area that I could, you know, sort the data that way and show that and maybe drive my instructional programs in a certain way based on the students that fit that criteria of the search for the report. Mike, can we take a pause and go to the Q&A? And you do have some questions also populating in the chat. Okay. Yeah, let me look at the Q&A real quick. Um, there is a question about an offline version of TABE, and we are working on an offline version. Um, I, I have heard that possibly at the in the end of the year or in the early spring, but I have not heard a firm date yet for that. Um, and then what is the time frame for scores being delivered and has that changed? And that's a good question and it has changed. So the the, the reports, and, and I know many of you have struggled with reports being slow after a student finishing finishes testing. The way that our reporting system was developed was it was had a, a parameter of 15 minutes for a turnaround time. What we uh, discovered internally was that our, 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 the process of those reports were broken into three categories, one for table nine and 10, one for table 11 and 12, and one for scanning table 11 and 12. Each of those processes met the requirement of being 15 minutes or less. What the challenge was and what we are working on correcting is that those three processes always were running successively 
in the background. So if, if, the, if our system was currently scoring tape nine and 10, and you were in a tape nine and 10 test, you would have to wait for that process to end and then it would do the table 11 one, and then it would do the scanning one, and then it would come back and do the 910, and that's when it would capture your data and score it and report it. So that's when we were un discovering that the turnaround time was going past the 15 minutes. What we've done to help with that, a couple of things. One was that we took tape 9 and 10 out of the process. So if you are still using tape 9 and 10, there is a note on the inside page that tells you that the scores are only uh, processed at 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock uh, each day, so only two times. There's also, uh, we did some other enhancements to the system. So as of last week, I think last Thursday, uh, the reports are now much quicker and it should be around five to 10 minutes um, for the turnaround time. So you should see a marked improvement as of last Thursday night uh, on the turnaround time for reports. Another piece on this needs improvement column that's on the page, it will work if it, on an older student, you can go back and run that report on an older student and get that information as well. Another question about interpreting results um, on the math profile, one domain in indicates six problems worth 10 points, indicating some questions were two, par two parts or two points. Um, if a student has one part correct, in zero points, is that a two-part question? So again, um, the types of questions dictate what the point value is. And the easiest ones are on the reading ones, um, the evidence-based selected response, which are two-part questions. If you get both parts correct, you'll get two points. If you get the first part correct, but the second part wrong, you get one point. But if you got the second part wrong only, you get zero points because on an evidence-based selected response, um, you're getting the main idea incorrect, but you got your evidence to support that main idea correct. And that's why you, you can't have that under the scoring rules and you would get zero points. So typically when we look at two point questions, it is asking you for uh, whether it's two parts, but the directions of that question will drive the point value. If it's asking you for two answers, then typically it would be a two point question for that. Um, another question around the profile report. And the question says, um, the proficiency level of each skill or continue to provide proficiency in, in the domain. So I'll go back a, a slide and talk about the proficiency levels on the first part of the page. So the proficiency category will, will remain there. The proficiency area also is a little bit different from tape nine and 10. Tape nine and 10, it was strictly related to the number of questions you answered. So if we use the first example, math had six questions. If you got more than 50% of those correct, you were partially mastered or partially proficient. If you got more than 75% correct, you were fully mastered or fully proficient. It didn't matter what those questions were, it just mattered how many of them you got correct. In table 11 and 12, we changed to use item response theory algorithms to look at the weight of each question and then based on the statistical values, set the proficiency levels. So again, reading is the easy example that I can demonstrate. If we look at level A of reading, that's ninth to 12th grade content. Statistically, a ninth grade question is probably gonna be easier than a 12th grade question. It might be a small statistical difference, but if a student got all the ninth grade questions right, but none of the 12th grade questions, what, you know, what's the threshold or the cut point to be partially proficient or not proficient or, or proficient in that uh, scenario? So our, our research scientists have set up tables for that based on the, the weight of each question and getting a total value for the test. So much more, um, detailed and specific information on the proficiencies where tape nine and 10 was just a, a average, you know, based on the, um, the number of questions correct for that. And uh, there's a question that talk about the standard error of measurement at the top of the report, the SEM column. Standard error of measurement is the plus or minus factor to the scale score. So all assessments have uh, an error factor or error rate. Uh, very similar to how elections are, you know, predictions for elections are plus or minus 
two or three points on an election prediction. Uh, the standard error measurement for a tape could be very low, like we see it here as 14. So that means the math score for this student could be 14 points higher or lower based on the standard error of the test. We want to have that number very small because 14 points above or below doesn't really change where that student is performing. If I gave a student too hard of a test or too easy of a test, they may score really high or really low, but their standard error of measurement would go up dramatically. So sometimes you could see a standard error measurement of 100 points. Now, if my score was 500 and my plus or minus is 100, that is a big swing and that demonstrate that that student was either tested on a level too high or too low for, for, the, for their expectations. Uh, there's a question about removing the blank page that prints out with each subject report. Um, I think that is only if you don't take the test. So, and again, you don't need to print all the pages. When you go do to print the report, you can say print just page one or page two, or as you're saving it as a PDF, you can also specify what, what pages you're saving for that. I will look into it, but I'll see uh, for that. And let me jump back to the presentation. And Mike, did you address the question about the uh, test times approved for Florida? And um, second part to that question, any plans on increasing the number of students allowed in a session beyond 50? Yeah, so a couple of, uh, I, and I don't have, I don't know on the test times for Florida yet, I'll have to get an update for that, so I will work on that. Um, and the test sessions right now in TAVE Online, we, we do ask to have, you can have as many sessions as you want, but no more than 50 students in a session, 50 to 60 students in a session. So, um, and that's to help the screens populate. N normally it slows down when they, when you go to another screen to display the list of students that are in those sessions. So um, if it gets much more than 60, I know we had some sessions that had thousands of students in it and it took a long time for this, the pages to regenerate. We are looking at that. We did try, you know, very easily to throw more hardware at the, the problem and have more servers and then that did not work. So they're working on some of the coding for that in the background to see what they can do to, to uh, allow for test sessions to have more students and still be able to uh, move quickly through the system. Um, looking at some of the chat questions. Um, the question about the locator, will the locator move students from question to question if they do not move quickly? No, it's, it's just as with the same time, it's the overall time limit. There's not a question limit or time limit for that. And then um, let me see if there's any other questions that we can answer quickly here. Somebody did say that they, they've seen the reports get faster. Um, so that's, that's encouraging to hear that news. I'll come back to some of the questions here as we uh, get near the end of the presentation. I do want to talk about some of the correlations that we have going on, correlation studies. One of them is to TABE and to college placement assessments, specifically the ACT or the AccuPlacer. And if you search on Google for TABE and AccuPlacer or TABE and Compass, there were old correlations done. And we've had a lot of requests from programs in other states that have asked for these correlations to be updated. So we are in the process of that. This one's taken a little bit of time because you have to have a student that takes TABE and then takes one of these other assessments in a 60 to 90 day period. But then we also have to have that data together. So uh, a lot of times the ACT or AccuPlacer data is a little hard to get. And so we're, we've been working on that with a, a number of programs, but that is underway to try to develop that correlation or refresh that correlation. We also are in the process of developing um, correlated scores to the high school equivalency test. We just finished the correlation of TABE to TASC, which is our high school equivalency test. And that's being released this week on our website as a correlation report. And it does say here to level A, it's actually level A and level D. So we're providing um, TABE scale scores and the likelihood of a passing score on the high school equivalency test in we have, as I mentioned, completed the task correlation. The GED is the next one up. We're still collecting a little bit of data to do the analysis of that. And then the high set test will be the third one that we complete. 
in um, some states, in South Carolina specifically, has a program now that if a student gets a certain score on reading or math of TABE, they are then uh, exempt from taking that section of the high school equivalency test. So it shortens the pathway for a student and reduces the cost for the student uh, if they can demonstrate with TABE. In South Carolina, it's specifically level A of TABE. Uh, New York is looking at level D and level A uh, in their program because they already have a similar program with their Regents exam for high school students. So once we have this data out, we'll, other states are looking at that and I'll certainly I'll provide that information to Florida if that's a possibility. Those are state level decisions, not, not a TABE decision on those kind of correlations and, and pathways for students. Let me look at a couple more questions real quick. And I know we're running up against the clock, so I want to be aware of that. Uh, question about, can you tell me how long the time breakdown per question is on the reading and language test? Um, it's, it's around two minutes per question um, on there. Some of them are a little bit less. Uh, I think the reading is a little bit less than two minutes or one's a little bit more than two minutes, one's a little bit under two minutes. But you can simply, you know, take the time and divide it by the, the 40 or 45 questions on the test for that to get the exact per question. But again, it's the total time for the test, not an item by item time limit for the students. June, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn things over to you to kind of wrap up on the feedback section. And I'll continue to look at some of the questions. Okay, thank you, Mike. So while Mike's looking at some questions, we'll provide, um, you're gonna see a feedback slide that's gonna come onto your screen right now. So if you would, just take an opportunity to answer these questions. And then what we'll do is we'll come back to Mike to close out and answer the last questions that you've proposed on your chat or Q and A. So we'll give you a few, few more minutes, uh, one minute to answer these three short questions. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the poll out. And Mike, we're gonna turn it back over to you and see if there's any last minute questions that you can address for us. Sure, I think the only one I see that is a little bit different is that it says CTB programs are require, that require level A math presents a scientific calculator. May we also provide an external four function calculator we have students that are not familiar with the scientific. And I believe that's a state question, so um, I, I won't be able to give you a policy answer on that. On um, It would be allowable, but I don't know if it's allowed under the state policy to have a, a handheld four function calculator for the level A math um, for that. Again, I think the, you know using the calculator, that's part of the instructional programs that maybe they could benefit for, from the adult ed is to be able to how to use those calculators as they are the same ones for the high school equivalency tests. And we'll get back to you on these answers from the Florida Department of Education because we have Lisa Williams on the call today too. So we will address those and give you the answers to those questions regarding the state policies. And I don't see any other, I know there's some questions about exemptions on there, so I, I, we can forward those to Lisa as well. Um, to get the state answer for those. I don't see any other questions that we haven't addressed yet. Um, let me just real quick go through that. The question about, we find that textbooks or software related resources are either under aligned or over aligned to table 11 and 12. And um, so one of the pieces with our publishing partners, whether they're the online publishing partners or the, or the paper, paper based publishing partners is that we are looking at having a, an approval process. Uh, right now, anybody could put TABE on a book and we don't have uh, any review process on is that a good aligned book. But um, our product development team is looking at working with the publishers to either have an internal or a third party review of that content 
before we give it, let's say, a stamp of approval to use the tape name. So that, that is something that is being looked at for a publishing program. And Mike, the question about the archive for the webinar, yes, all of the webinars are archived on the IPDA website and this one will be up there within 24 hours. And thank you for your kind words. There's a lot of um, nice feedback coming through, Mike. So we really appreciate your time and expertise in sharing this information with us. Sure. So I think on that, we're going to end the um, webinar for today. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.